Breaches and cybersecurity incidents are making headlines every day. What are you doing to be prepared? Welcome to the Tripwire Cybersecurity Podcast, brought to you by Tripwire, the show that explores cybersecurity for the enterprise and how to identify and protect against cyber threats before they happen. Listen for techniques and best practices to harden your defenses against hackers. Now, here's your host, Tim Erlin. Welcome to the Tripwire Cybersecurity Podcast. I'm Tim Erlin, Vice President of Product Management and Strategy at Tripwire. And today I am joined by Lane Thames, Principal Security Researcher at Tripwire. Lane and I have worked together for a long time across a variety of topics. And today we're going to talk about industrial cybersecurity and sort of the, the IT, OT, technology and market divide that we see in the industry. Lane will come at it more from a, a security researcher standpoint. I will come at it more from a, a market standpoint, and we'll see where we end up. I think it'll be interesting. So welcome, Lane. Hi, Tim. Good to be here. So I wanted to start out with this term ITOT convergence, which we talk a lot about at Tripwire and I see in the industry. Um, and I, I have a, an understanding of what that means from sort of a, a high-level product standpoint. But how does that ITOT convergence term surface in the, the security research space that you're in, Lane? So I guess we can start off with uh, three words. One is internet protocol, internet protocol networks, ethernet networks and such. Two is data. Three is insight. Um, so essentially what's happening is in the past, <clears throat> and I say the past, the timelines are kind of strange here, but let's just go back into the late 90s, early 2000s. When we dealt with manufacturing, we were living in what was called the, uh, the third industrial revolution where we had machines that had computers and controllers and we had digital technology uh, where we could process signals and such. And that allowed us to, you know, do all the great things we do with manufacturing. And, and I'm going to focus mostly on manufacturing because that's my background uh, in this space. But... Um, ITOT convergence is now uh, what happened is folks wanted to start connecting OT devices, operational technology devices, things like sensors, actuators, robots, um, programmable logic controllers, you name it. They wanted to connect them to their IT or internet protocol based networks. And there's various reasons for that. Um, as I mentioned earlier, data which then leads to insights. I want to point out what I think you're saying and make sure I understand it. There was a long period of time there where the manufacturing technology, the industrial technology was built and developed and, uh, you know, sort of placed in market parallel but separate from what we would traditionally call, you know, IT. Does that, is that right? That is correct. There's a whole plethora of industrial-based protocols that um, they would speak their own language. Sometimes it was just using serial communication, for example. Their focus was on digital and analog inputs and outputs. And, you know, your sensor would connect to a programmable logic controller, which was a very, very simple computer. And at most, those devices would connect to machines on the shop floor. And those devices are still connected on the shop floor, e even running like machine, you know, like... <clears throat> Uh, using um, engineering workstations that <laughs> even today are still running Windows XP. But yes, they were totally isolated. They spoke their own language, and there was no way to get data into a higher level analysis outside of what we called sneaker nets. People literally uh, multiple times a day running into the field with a clipboard and taking measurements and coming back and adding those into spreadsheets and such. Yeah, and I think that's important because it, it's not like these industrial technologies are just showing up now and being introduced to our networks, uh, IT networks. They've been around for a long time. So there's an established industry there uh, that just happens to have been built very differently from what we would call, you know, IT. Absolutely. Absolutely. Totally, totally disconnected from IT, totally different technologies. And in fact, the subject matter experts were, it's interesting, um, they understand how to write code, they understand computers, but they're engineers, they're control engineers, and, and they don't really speak IT, they speak their own language. The, so <laughs> they speak their own language and they have their own technologies as compared to IT. Yeah. 
And so that, that brings us to this point about convergence, which I think is where you were before I interrupted you there. Right. <clears throat> so what started happening, and really kind of two things. Um, one, when you talk about these OT systems, they're very, very expensive. And they're very, very long lived because of their, you know, the capital expenditures and such. Um, so two spectrum, two things are happening right now uh, in, in, side, in terms of this ITOT convergence. One is retrofitting, where we're taking cheap computer devices. And just as an example, a, a Raspberry Pi or these very, very simple computers that have an Ethernet interface or a Wi-Fi interface. And we're literally interfacing these devices with old equipment. For example, I was uh, listening to a conference presentation a few weeks ago about this guy who was telling his story of how he was doing ITOT convergence. This was a small manufacturing company, and they had mostly CNC machines, computer numerically controlled machines that actually cut metal and, and material to build widgets. And he had a project where they wanted to be able to gather data uh, on these CNC machines. And so he literally came in and, and retrofitted them and connect them over Wi-Fi to the, <laughs> to the IT network. But on the other hand, um, you have new equipment <clears throat> that is being built now with Ethernet or Wi-Fi already built in. And so over time, uh, as people start replacing their equipment, uh, these devices will still sometimes speak the old languages. Uh, they still have to interface with other technologies, but they're also going to be equipped with a little bit more intelligence and the ability to communicate over the internet. Yeah, there's a there's a distinction there. I don't know if distinction is the right word, but a, a, a dynamic maybe that I think is worth pointing out that um, in manufacturing, in industrial, in general, industrial technology, there's this juxtaposition of old equipment and brand new equipment because the the folks who manufacture that equipment they have also moved forward in terms of technology but the long life of the equipment that's deployed means that you have you know this 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 strange sort of combination of of old and new equipment in the same facility potentially correct and that's a, i think that's an aspect of of convergence that we don't necessarily think of uh, right away, we often think about um, the idea of you know connecting my old uh, manufacturing equipment into my IT network so I can get data out of it, which is what you're describing. But at the same time, you've got new equipment that's actually built for that kind of a connection, in theory, we'll say, coming into the same environment. So there's really sort of three pieces to it. So this uh, this particular uh, engineer that I was just talking about interfacing the CNC machines, their purpose for this was solely they had a lot of variants in their manufacturing. They would have one shift that would say could make a certain amount of things in say three hours, where they had another machine at a different shift that was say doing twice as much. And so their end goal was, you know, how how can we figure out why, why is this? Is it the, is it a human error? Is it um, machine mal, uh, malfunctions? Uh, things of that nature. Um, and when you get to the other end of the spectrum, let's just say you've got large organizations. I'm just going to use GE as an example because they've been driving a lot of what we call Industry 4.0. For example, I believe they invented the idea of what's called a digital twin. A digital twin takes all of this data from the shop floor that we have, and they ring it through simulators, for example. And so you can actually see, almost in real time, a simulation of a real-world process. And so the where I'm going to is that's that's why this 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 provides a significant amount of insight, you know, data, information, knowledge, wisdom, if you will. Um, but this is going to lead to very, very large amounts of money gained in terms of uh, maximizing uh, productivity, minimizing downtime, predictive maintenance, and all of this kind of good stuff. And so that's that's going back to ITOT convergence. Um, that ITOT convergence is kind of, I guess, a fundamental requirement to 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 move into this more, you know, this this newer era of Industry 4.0 where we're going to have countless devices that are um, going to be interfaced with 
uh, intelligence, com uh, computing, and communication so that we can gather this data and uh, process it. Yeah, it's interesting. I, it's tempting to think of that industry 4.0 coming more from the IT side. It's tempting to think about it as, you know, OT or industrial finally adopting, you know, enterprise IT practices. But it's, I think it's really unfair to sort of characterize it that way because you have a whole industry that's built around, you know, efficiency of, of process that's taking advantage in many ways of, of, of new capabilities like that digital twin uh, thing that you're talking about, new capabilities to drive more efficiency and, and analysis for those processes, which are very different from the processes that we would, we would consider on the IT side of things. Exactly. Yep. Well, and that brings me to another term that I wanted to throw into the mix here that, that um, you know, you see everywhere these days, which is IoT, right? So where does IoT fit into this uh, sort of trend of, of convergence? Okay. Um, yeah, this is where it gets interesting. And, and here's how I break it down. Um, I personally like Cisco's term, Internet of Everything. Um, but, you know, the common use is Internet of Things. Now, the Internet, Internet of Things kind of originated uh, a long time ago, really even before we had lots of mini computers it was you know, this is back in the time where you know flip phones were still the thing and such but rfid technology was invented and so the idea of the internet of things originally originated from okay we're going to put these rfid chips on everything and that way we can start tracking it right so it was usually it was initially a tracking mechanism for example inventory and then what happened as computing uh, got cheaper and cheaper and cheaper, and as bandwidth got greater and greater and greater, well, now we have this idea idea of building intelligence. And when I say intelligence, I'm really meaning computing and communication. And when I say communication, I'm talking about internet-based communication or IP networking. It got to a point to where everything is going to have a computer and a network uh, networking capability. And so then that's where the idea of the Internet of Things evolved. Now me, I, uh, there's also another term that we should mention, and it's the Industrial Internet of Things. And to me, Industrial Internet of Things is a subset of the Internet of Things. And this is really, uh, when we talk about ITOT convergence and IOT, uh, literally where this fits in is all of the devices that are coming onto the shop floor with computer and communication, internet-based communication capabilities. That is the Internet of Things pretty much by its definition. So the ITOT convergence is being, it is, exists because of the so-called Internet of Things paradigm. You are listening to the Tripwire Cybersecurity Podcast. Thousands of organizations rely on Tripwire to serve as the core of their cybersecurity programs. Why? Because we detect suspicious activity before it becomes breach. Our systems work on-site and in the cloud to find, monitor, and minimize a wide range of threats. With deep system visibility and automated compliance, we help you shorten the time it takes to catch vulnerabilities and ensure your organization is following the absolute best practices in cybersecurity today. For more information, visit tripwire.com. That's tripwire.com. The term IoT really seems like it's a it's a label, a modern label for things that were already, you know, in existence but have now continued to develop. Like, you know, there have been devices that have a network interface to a physical a device that makes a physical change in the environment you know prior to the term iot right and then the industrial one that's that's useful i had a uh uh you know an ot engineer who um in this type of a conversation categorized uh iot as just you know consumer iot in this case as you know cheap ot basically uh, yeah the idea yeah, being I, a lot of people do yeah the idea being that he's been working with you know, OT devices for a long time that actually, you know, have this network physical connection. And IoT is really just the cheap consumer version of what he's been doing for, you know, years and years and years. I, I would take it, a, I, I think I would take it a step further because what you just said is true. Um, these devices connected in, so 
you have devices that are at the uh, the shop level, the, the you know on the floor level, and they would communicate. If you look at what's called the Purdue model, you have various levels, and so these devices on the bottom, or you know, if if you look at it on, down at the bottom of the drawing is level zero, and that represents all of the sensors and actuators and equipment on the floor, and they would actually connect to say engineering workstations, HMIs, human machine interfaces, and such. And so, yeah, they were connecting over a network, whether it be IP or their original industrial protocols. To me, one of the one of the things that stands out with IoT is that these future devices, they might still connect in that way, but there are going to be capabilities for these devices. And I know control engineers that get mad with me every time I say this, but they're going to be commuting, communicating directly into the cloud, either directly or through a gateway. And it's, they're going to be pushing data into the cloud. And um, this is where various newer protocols like MQTT, for example, is going to help shine is because we will, will actually be able to do that in a secure fashion. Well, so what's the but alternative? To me, I mean, let, let's talk about the technology there for a minute. You men mentioned MQTT as, as the technology that might allow these devices to, to connect to the cloud directly. What's the alternative that's in place today or, or competing with MQTT? So you have your legacy integration, which is, to me, uh, and, and I, when I say legacy integration, that's kind of following the Purdue model, where everything is separate, as, you know, all of the different networks are separated via firewalls and switching and things of that nature. And the data doesn't necessarily leave the organization. It flows up and down this these levels of the Purdue model, um, but it's very, very complex. If you want to get... <laughs> and here's also where you start, sorry I'm sidetracking, but this is also where you start getting into the ITOT battles. IT, for example, they might want to connect through the different networks to a device for some reason. But then the, the OT guys, they might want to be able to send the, their data from PLC controllers up to, say, their ERP systems or enterprise resource planning systems for manufacturing optimization purposes. Right now, that's that's being done via opening firewalls and stuff and allowing this communication, but it's very complex just because of how the systems are involved, just because of the complexity of the network, and it's not scalable. So you might have 500 devices on your floor today, but in 10 years, you're going to have 50,000 that are potentially communicating. And so that's the other option, going back to your question, um, you have... It's kind of like the wild, wild west. <laughs> Anytime something new arises. You have a lots of folks right now that are offering various gateways that you can connect your devices to the gateway, and the gateway will just actually ship it into the cloud. But it's usually on a per vendor basis. And so the idea of something like MQTT, and there's another one called OPC-UA. UA stands for Unified Architecture. Unified Architecture is a big, big idea in the advanced manufacturing space. Uh, uh, MQTT provides it and OPC UA provides it. The arguments are that MQTT is lighter weight and more efficient, whereas the OPC-UA is, is, is a much more comp convoluted uh, protocol. But the point being is they're not vendor neutral. They're unified and open architectures. And so that's why those are probably going to be the winners in this game or things like that. Yeah, but it brings us back to that challenge of, you know, the convergence, not just of IT and OT, but of old OT and new OT, if you want to think of it that way. MQTT isn't suddenly going to show up on those devices that you installed, you know, 10 years ago. Um, you know, you're going to be stuck with, with a mix of approaches until you've fully modernized, you know, that, that plant floor or that manufacturing facility. And, and I think it's going to stay that way forever. You know, when we talk about cloud, um, organizations moving to the cloud, we know for a fact that the cloud is forever going to be hybrid, right? Organizations are going to have legacy systems, legacy IT systems, and they're going to have cloud systems. And that's why we call it hybrid. I personally believe that in this, you know, this, this IT, OT convergence, it's going to be hybrid, um, at least for the next 20 years. Yeah, yeah. So you're you're likely to have increasingly specialized tools, products, capabilities for dealing with the older equipment as that modern equipment comes in, and you know the market trend you'll see there will be that that you know those companies become increasingly specialized or those capabilities maybe become increasingly specialized and costly 
until you get to a point where it's worthwhile to replace that older equipment because it's too expensive to to pull them in, integrate them. But that, I mean, that leaves us with this question of security. You know, when you said the, you know, the the existing model or the, you know, the, you know, integrated model with the Purdue model is is complex. My immediate response as a security professional is, you know, complexity, you know, breeds misconfigurations, breeds mistakes, and that's a problem. That's a huge problem, and that's why I personally, that that's I see that as a huge challenge, um, in terms of configuration, exactly. Um, and that's, I think some of the newer models, I don't want to just keep going. I, I, the reason I keep going back to MQTT, cause that's kind of what I've been studying for the past few months, uh, with some new interest of mine, but it, it has a mechanism to where you can provide the data to any consumer that needs it. And all you have to do is allow the devices to, you know, using what's things, you know, I think they call them data diodes and things, but basically one way out communication, you don't have to open up all these firewalls and change all, make all these configurations to get data from your floor throughout your system, you know, using something like a publish uh, and subscribe model. Um, it's, it, it just takes the complexity away, gives you the data you need while keeping security. It really, this type of model, <laughs> in my mind, uh, grew out of the old days of uh, botnets and command and control. Um, back in the early days of the internet, pretty much everything was open. There were no firewalls, no such thing as a firewall. But as we started, you know, as security came to play, and, and especially once we had, you know, uh, malicious actors that were doing it for profit, we had to start closing our networks with firewalls. And so the idea of a command and control architecture came out of that to where you could communicate with a device behind a firewall without even having to open up the firewall. And it's based off of how TCP IP works. But the whole idea of it is you can now distribute information while not having to have a bunch of crazy, insecure configurations. Hmm. So given that, that we have this future that's hybrid, um, I mean, that sounds good. That's a solution that's sort of forward looking. How, how are you seeing security professionals dealing with the legacy environments today? What, what are the, the trends and complications there? They're fairly significant. Um, I'll go back to the retrofitting example. So you have all of these folks that are just buying whatever kinds of devices they can find to solve their current problems. Well, um, as well as not just that, as well as all the new devices we have that are coming in, um, the problem is inventory, you know, visibility. How do we know what's out there? And then how do we know what kind of weaknesses they have, what kind of misconfigurations, uh, what kind of vulnerabilities that are going to have? These systems are not going to be upgraded. You know, these guys are going to, you know, people that are doing this, they're just going to put them in the field most of the time. You know, they say they're secure because they're behind the firewall. Um, but the problem happens, and in, and in fact, um, these devices aren't currently directly connected to the Internet, but what's going to happen and where the security problem lies is when the malicious actors penetrate the top level of the Purdue model, our enterprise IT systems, and then they work their way down through the networks and gain access to these devices on the shop floor. And this is a huge problem because one thing we haven't really mentioned um, are really the priorities um, in terms of security. When we talk about devices on the floor, the shop floor, uh, safety and availability are the two main drivers. And so the security concern here is not so much that they can hack into the device. The data that's down there living on these little devices are in, is in, insignificant. It's misconfiguring the devices so that they screw up a, a real world process and, and damage equipment or even uh, cause death or harm to people. And that's, I, I mean, it's it's interesting because you you touched on the the fact that it's the you know the more IT like layers of the Purdue model or the organization that provide that initial point of access. And from a market standpoint, what we're seeing is as a result of this ITOT convergence is an increasing number of CISOs who are adding OT responsibility to their plate. So you know you might have been five years ago you might have been a CISO for a manufacturing organization 
but you were really only responsible for the IT assets. The OT assets were handled separately. The plant managers were responsible for them. And their focus, as you point out, was on, you know, reliability, uptime, safety. Uh, but now as those connections are growing and as we're seeing that that attack vector or attack surface shift, those CISOs are having to, to deal with uh, safety and reliability as primary motivators in those environments, which they didn't have that same perspective for their IT assets. So there's a there's a shift at the technology level that's driving a, a, a new dynamic for the the you know at the, the the people level as well. Correct. Yep. Yeah, it's fascinating. I personally, you know, right now at this point uh, in the world, see if you will, this point in the shift towards uh, Industry 4.0, um, to me, when we talk about security, I'm I, I, what I constantly want to say is. Getting your and making sure your IT systems are safe and secure is priority one because, as I mentioned, that is their entry to the networks. And then, you know, as an industry, we're learning. You know, we <laughs> this is this this is really kind of new. And even those of us who are in security, it's like you know, how do we solve these security problems? It's a very complex, you know, environment. You can't just update software. Um, you, and, and but the biggest thing. Is scale. You know, how do you? As I mentioned, it's today. It might be 500, but in five years, it might be 50,000. How do you deal with that scale? These are going to be some challenges that we're going to have to address and find new innovative solutions uh, for handling this. Well, Lane, it, it seems like we didn't uh, we didn't maybe come up with any any solutions here, but we certainly covered the problems in, in pretty interesting ways. Um, and I think there's there's a lot more to talk about um, as we move forward. So. I really appreciate you spending the time with us. I hope it was interesting for all of the listeners and uh, lots of topics that we could continue in, in other podcasts or in other forums down the road as well. So thank you, Lane. All right. Thank you. And thanks, everyone else. Please tune in for the next episode of the Tripwire Cybersecurity Podcast. You have been listening to the Tripwire Cybersecurity Podcast. Join us next time as we explore stories of people protecting people and techniques and best practices to harden your defenses against hackers. We'll talk to you next time on the Tripwire Cybersecurity Podcast.